off. We're standing here in the conservation laboratories at the Kimball Art Museum with uh, John Lorenzo Bernini's model for the Fountain of the Moor, which is arguably the most stupendous terracotta model that survives today anywhere in the world by John Lorenzo Bernini, who was the master of 17th century sculpture in Rome. This was a model that he created probably in 1653, in the early part of 1653, for a fountain that he was commissioned to execute at the southern end of Piazza Navona in Rome. Um, 1651, he just wrapped up and completed the stunning Fountain of the Four Rivers, which is in the center of the piazza. And uh, the Pope at the time, Innocent X, overwhelmed with the success of that fountain, immediately decided that he wanted another fountain at the southern end across from his great palace. And Bernini went to work trying to design a fountain. But what's remarkable about this story is the uh, first time around, Bernini produced what seems to be a, a rather totally unremarkable design, um, basically of a snail with some, some creature coming out of it. Pope had a look at it, decided it, it wasn't good enough to be in front of his palace, had it shipped off. Bernini tried another time created something a little bit more interesting, but uh, again, it didn't pass muster, and both the Pope and his powerful sister-in-law decided it too um, had to go. Um, so third time around, Bernini was at this point where he was possibly facing uh, a bit of an embarrassing situation, and uh, um, I think he really decided he really needed to knock it out of the park and create what is really uh, just an absolutely virtuoso piece of modeling. Um, the Pamphili had had a tradition of being overwhelmed with, with great presentation models. There's a story that for the Four Rivers Fountain, um, Bernini had created this elaborate model in silver that he snuck into a dinner party. And the Pope came around the corner and, and saw this marvelous model and uh, immediately hired Bernini. Um, and I think Bernini was thinking back to that moment and realizing that he needed to create an absolutely showcase for his talents, which he did, uh, this, this model of a sea deity. We call it the, the Fountain of the Moor uh, for the Moorish features of the face. But in fact, he's just depicting a sea deity uh, with a dolphin sitting on this shell. Um, the, the commission seems to have been awarded about May 1653, and Bernini would then entrust the actual execution of the fountain to one of his assistants, um, Giovanni Antonio Marie. The first difficulty um, is that this is a, a very different model from the type we're normally accustomed to, to seeing from Bernini. Um, generally, models from the Italian Renaissance, the Italian Baroque, are classified into two different types. You have small little quick sketch models, uh, like the angels at the Kimball, um, and then you have larger modelli, and this is classified as a modelli, it's more finished. And not many of these survive by Bernini, and it's much more difficult to find signs of his individual handmaking because they're much more highly finished. Um, but Tony turned to looking very closely at the surface and began to see things that uh, we feel only Bernini himself could have done. Well, we know that Bernini um, never bothered to hollow out his sketch models. This is a more finished presentation model. And so he clearly spent a little more time hollowing the head and the chest, the, the most critical um, uh, points of, of the sculpture, so that they would survive undamaged through the firing. One, one of the other reasons that we know it's by Bernini is because of the variety of levels of finish that he undertook. Most other sculptors of his era working with clay would tend to finish everything, perhaps very beautifully, but in a rather uniform way. Whereas Bernini lavished attention smoothing with the brushes in, in these beautiful brush strokes to accentuate all the, the fleshy surfaces and the, the face is an absolute masterpiece of very delicate, perfectly finished clay. In other areas, Bernini was very, very loose. He, he approached the rocks as a sketch model. They're, they're rendered very quickly and roughly with, with tool marks and finger smears going across them. If you look at these marks on the dolphin creating the fish scales, they're very rough, and you notice how the end of each little stroke displaces a little blob of clay. Well, rather than smooth all those off, as some other sculptor might, to make everything pretty, Bernini has left all those, and they catch the light, and they make that dolphin sparkle. So Bernini knew that overfinishing was 
just as bad as not finishing enough in, in some areas. And he knew how to use these different levels of completion to really energize his sculpture and not kill it with overfinishing. And in talking about finishing Bernini's terracotta surfaces, he would come along and uh, smooth the face with a cloth, with a brush, and so on, but not wanting to leave it at that completely smooth, uniform look, he would take his, his tools and go in, back into the smooth clay and reinforce and restate areas like the mustaches and the eyebrows and the beard and um, uh, hair around the chin. So these are fresh tool marks that Bernini put into previously smoothed areas to make them snap and to give them those crisp edges that would catch the light and rather, rather than leaving them as kind of comparatively dead, smooth surfaces. Other evidence that can be brought to bear on the attribution is simply comparing this model to the finished sculpture and you see that this is much, much more complex than the finished sculpture, and it's very unlikely um, that Bernini is actually going to execute a, a weaker design. And I mean, one case in point um, is, the, is the raised heel um, at the back. Um, this is a very important, beautiful detail, sort of showing the springiness of the, of the figure as he's coming off the shell. And if you look at the finished statue, it's a flat-footed heel. Um, both uh, you know, the, the sculpture as a whole is somewhat flat-footed in that regard. And I think the circumstances of the commission, when he's sort of up against the wall and the Pope, and there's other complicating circumstances where his reputation as an architect had been threatened just at that moment. So he really wanted to prove himself. Whereas maybe with other Popes, he might have turned uh, a model such as this over to an assistant to let him execute based on a few sketches. But here I really feel like, you know, this is Bernini. I mean, when you come in and you look at the way that um, the, the skin is so delicately um, strided and brushed um, over the circumference of the forms in a way that really accentuates the fleshiness. You know, these are things you just don't see on other terracottas by other sculptors necessarily. It, it shows a mind uh, of a, a greater thinker, and that has to be Bernini. Mm -hmm.